Good evening, saints and friends. I am Dr. Michael Andrew Owens, pastor of the New Hope Missionary Baptist Church of San Bernardino, California. And I am pleased to share with you uh, a ministry of our church, which is Word Wednesdays in the Word. Today we uh, continued our Bible study series on becoming a disciple. It was a Zoom meeting kind of sharing experience and uh, you're a part of our New Hope family or a friend of our ministry, you can call our church office or email us at newhopembc.org and give us your email and cell number and we will consider you registered for our Zoom Bible study and send you a link to join us for Wednesdays at noon live. Uh, this evening we're posting uh, this Bible study so that those who missed that encounter might be able to share in the word that was uh, delivered earlier in the day. Our Bible study series is on becoming a disciple. And I think that it is a timely uh, consideration for us who are followers of Jesus Christ because we have just recently celebrated the resurrection of our Lord. And clearly uh, he meant to deposit with those that were the closest of his disciples, the message that he had been preaching and the, uh, to uh, commission them to carry on the mission that he came to fulfill. And now it is incumbent upon us to carry that message and to fulfill that mission in our own day and time. It is also important to consider what it means to be a disciple because under normal conditions, our witness is so tied to our church location, to our church organization. We pride ourselves in being faithful churchgoers. But in this season, where the virus has prevented our assembly, our regular time of fellowship and getting together, <clears throat> it is incumbent upon us to consider what it really means to be a disciple, uh, not just among our own church family, not just at a church location, but what it means to be a disciple in word and in deed, what the living witness uh, of what we believe actually looks like at home and as we interact with others outside of the church building. Let me remind you that the Apostle Paul is clear that we are the church of Jesus Christ, that because of the faith that we have because we have received the word of the Lord with rejoicing and invited the Holy Spirit of our Lord to indwell, uh, to dwell richly in our hearts. We are the church and the church is in us. And so is our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. And so while we are uh, disrupted from our ability to assemble, we are still called upon to be the reflection of who Jesus is and to represent him in the world. I like how the Apostle Paul put it when he talked about the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, that he wouldn't share what he has learned about the Lord. He wouldn't rather trade what he has learned about the Lord for anything. And that he would always want to be, as he said, found in him. Philippians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10 says, I want to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. See, Paul was very much a legalist before he became a man of faith before he became a man uh, imbued with the power of the Spirit of God. Uh, in our Christian witness, a lot of times, we simply pride ourselves in being found at the church. We're, we're at a ministry meeting on Monday, we're at a rehearsal on Tuesday, we're at Bible study on Wednesday, we're back at rehearsal on Thursday, we're socializing on Friday, and uh, right back at it on Sunday morning, but I'm glad that we have this opportunity 
to really consider what it means to represent Christ uh, in word and deed according to the faith that we have that he is real. Uh, I don't know about you, but I also want to be found in him. Having just celebrated the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the words of Paul uh, ring especially true and are especially profound because it is only by the power of the Lord's resurrection that we are able to live a holy life, that we're able to live a life following the example of Jesus Christ because by our own nature, we can't meet that standard. But by the power of his resurrection, which has overcome uh, sin, death, hell, and the grave, he means for us to know that we can be victorious over anything that comes against us, over anything that would uh, appear to be greater than our resolve to live right. Uh, and so I'm thankful for the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we are, saints, post-resurrection. It is incumbent upon us now to carry his message and to fulfill the mission of uh, bringing this world uh, the, the word and the gift of salvation so that the kingdom of this world might become the kingdom of our God. The message and the commission that Jesus imparted in Matthew 28, 19, and 20 says, Go therefore and make disciples. Now, I teach people whenever you see therefore in the word, it means go back and get what has come before. And what has come before him saying go therefore is uh, three years of ministry, preaching and teaching on the kingdom of God and uh, having taken to heart the promises of our Lord Jesus Christ that now that he is not among us, uh, he will dwell in us by way of his Holy Spirit. And so because he has promised to be with us and to be in us, we have power, we have authority uh, to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them as we have been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The commission says, teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you and lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. And so let us take to heart, my friends, that commission in this day and time, because the commission to go into all the world and to teach all nations is very much, uh, in, uh, very much our responsibility when we clearly now have the technology to go global with the message of Jesus Christ. Most of us will not cross the seas to far and distant lands. Most of us will not go to other peoples uh, that we do not know, other cultures. Uh, many times we don't even leave the surrounds of our neighborhood or our own particular city or state. But uh, the virus being a, a, uh, a scourge that has wrapped around the globe, uh, its impact uh, being such that it has stalled the work of uh, Fortune 500 companies and uh, global businesses and caused the rulers of nations to go into their secret closets, if you will, to try to find ways to strategize uh, securing the health and welfare uh, of their people. Uh, it's a time when we want to make sure that the word of God has global impact that the witness of Jesus Christ gets to people all around the world. And we're thankful that uh, we've been challenged to move beyond our walls <clears throat> where we have been so comfortable worshiping and so comfortable studying. Now uh, we have this technology that allows us to speak around the world all at the same time. And uh, the smallest church and the largest church uh, can use what's available to us now to preach the gospel, to teach people about the message of Jesus Christ, and to together uh, call on the Spirit of God for guidance about how to make it through this season. Well, 
Let us go back to understanding what a disciple is in terms of our word study. Uh, we find that the word disciple means to be a learner, but there's a special nuance to uh, what it means to be a disciple and a learner. Uh, a disciple is a learner with an emphasis on deliberately and intentionally following a teaching or teacher. So it's not just about knowledge, it's about practical application. Uh, it's not just about uh, something academic, it's about what you intend to incorporate into your life and your lifestyle. We know that uh, throughout our education, we have been in classrooms and in educational settings from elementary school to college, where we were clearly aware that uh, not every student was there with the same level of motivation. Uh, some were there to uh, try to excel and achieve the best that they could to get that A at all costs. Others were just there to get by. Some wanted to be a professional student and others wanted to uh, answer the question, what am I going to use this for? Some students wanted to be there to do well for their own satisfaction. Others just wanted to be able to impress their parents when they got home with good grades on their report card. Same way with the learners of Jesus Christ. There are some who very much want to follow his example. There are some who very much want to uh, fulfill his teachings. And there are other disciples who are, ha have a much more marginal relationship. They just want to be identified with the group. But clearly, the disciples who followed Jesus uh, were tested, were tried, had to face adverse conditions because whatever he faced, they had to also face. But when the heat was on, the word says they all forsook him and fled. My brethren, we want to be better disciples than that. We want to be in season and out of season, adhering to the word of the Lord. We want to stand our tests. We want to resist our temptations. We want to glorify our God by standing on his promises, uh, heeding his word, being obedient, and being faithful and fruitful in all that we do in following Jesus Christ. The word disciple has a root word uh, in Greek, mathetes, M-A-T-H-E-T-E-S, from which we get the word math. It means thought accompanied by endeavor. And you can't leave the last part of that definition out. Thought accompanied by endeavor. So as it applies to being a disciple, what that means is that the word of the Lord is not just meant to be thought-provoking. It's meant to convince you, to persuade you, to be a person to act on what you are thinking, what it is that you believe. So we are not, as disciples of Christ, seeking knowledge for knowledge's sake. We're not looking to be a professional student, some know-it-all who uh, is just proud of how much we've packed into our head. Uh, Jesus dealt with folk around him like that who thought they knew it all, who thought they knew the law and the prophets in and out. They were so proud of themselves. But Jesus read them like a book and said some of them were hypocrites because all they wanted to do was know, but they didn't have understanding. They knew the law, but they did not know the love of God. And so we want to be uh, followers of Jesus Christ in word and in deed, we want to learn of him so that we can live like him and live for him. Now, one thing you will find as you are a student of the word, especially in the New Testament, that uh, the New Testament church was born uh, in the midst of a Greek culture and was very much influenced by Greek literature. And in Greek literature, uh, there is a strong emphasis on the inner fellowship between the disciple and the teacher. So disciple did not just mean uh, followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, whatever teacher was prominent during the time 
uh, had followers, had students, had disciples, as it were. But the nuance uh, in Greek literature of what it meant to be a disciple takes on the meaning of not only being a follower of teachings, but uh, how you apply those teachings for its practical application, for its life application. So the relationship between the master and the disciple was one that was meant to be very close, so close that when the teacher actually passed on or, or died, as it were, the disciples of that teacher would continue to propagate the truth of that master, teacher, witnessing to his life, uh, witnessing to the impact on their own lives of what it is they learned from him. And so it is with us. Uh, we are called upon to uh, witness to the life and death of Jesus Christ, the teachings that he imparted to us and apply them to our living and then be a witness to the rest of the world about its transforming impact on who we are and how it is we live our lives. The resurrection uh, is a key tenet of our faith. In 1 Corinthians 15, 14, and 19, Paul says that if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and our faith is also empty that we are found to be false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Jesus Christ, whom he did, whom if he did not raise up, then it leaves us to be in a perilous situation because we are still in our sins. If in this life only, Paul says, we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. And so saints, uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we have just celebrated is so important to uh, our motivation for putting out the word of God to the rest of the world that Jesus lives. We are to called upon to reflect the resurrection of Jesus Christ by showing that what was dead can become alive again by the power of the Holy Spirit. So a great part of our witness is where we have come from to where we are. We have come from disgrace to grace. We have come from a life that was uh, separated from God to one that is now uh, beloved of God and welcomed as his children. You will notice in the Gospels as you are following uh, the call of the disciples, and the training of the disciples and the commission of the disciples once Jesus is resurrected and ascended, you'll find in the Gospels that there is a broad and a narrow use of the term disciple. It all depends on the degree of conviction and loyalty of those who attach themselves to Jesus. Again, uh, all teachers that were prominent in the day had disciples. John the Baptist had disciples. Jesus had disciples. The Pharisees, they had disciples and followers of their teaching. But uh, you will notice that uh, there are times when there's a reference to disciples in very general terms, and there's a reference to disciples meaning the 12 that he chose. Jesus clearly had tremendous drawing power. His teachings and his miraculous works drew a lot of attention, but everyone's response was not with the same level of conviction or commitment. Some followed him because they liked listening to him, but uh, it wasn't necessarily true that they would go away and live for him. We know that some would shout hallelujah praises, but when it came time to say, give us Jesus, not Barabbas, you know which way the crowd went. And so there were many who uh, left saying, never a man spake like this man, but it did not necessarily mean that they were gonna give their lives to him. There were many who followed him because of his miraculous works, because he healed, because he cast out demons, because he raised the dead. But 
the same level of commitment and conviction was not necessarily found among those who left the scene once Jesus had preached and done miraculous works. In Luke 6, 12 to 18, hear these words. It came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto them his disciples, and of them he chose twelve. So here the word disciples refers to a whole lot of people who was following Jesus around. And of them he chose twelve, whom he named apostles. Then the scripture goes on to name that twelve, and in verse 17, it says, He came down with them and stood in the plain and the company of his disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And so again, the 12 was chosen from a multitude of people who came out to hear Jesus and to witness his miraculous works or to be benefited by his power to heal them of their diseases. Folk who were vexed with unclean spirits were healed and the whole multitude, it is said, sought to touch them for there went virtue out of him and he healed them all. Oh, he was a blessing indeed. But again, not everyone responded the same way. Check your own self as I share with you the Beatitudes, some of the, an excerpt from the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus now challenges his disciples to be like him, challenges, challenges his disciples to be stretched beyond their own nature, to be made brand new. Verse 22, blessed are you when men shall hate you, when they shall separate you from their company, shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Well, that is a clear caveat that men will hate you, they'll want to separate you, they'll want to cast you out, they'll want to reproach you, they'll want to do evil to you, but you ought to consider yourself blessed when it happens to you because you're a representative of Jesus Christ because you're walking so close to him that what happens to him happens to you as well. Verse 23 to 29 gives us some challenging standards to reach up to in trying to be like Jesus. He says, rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. They suffered, but woe unto you, that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Here's where it gets really hard, really challenging. But I say to you which hear, and that would be us, love your enemies. Do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on one cheek, offer also the other. To him that taketh away your cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asks of thee. And of him that taketh away your goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do also to them. Whoa, if you were on that mountainside and heard these words, would you come away a disciple of Jesus? If you learned that you had to stretch yourself beyond your, your natural tendencies to love those that hate you and to lend to those and not expect anything in return, would you still want to be a disciple? Jesus put it out there front and center that this was not going to be an easy task, which is why he wants us to stay close to him because without resurrection power, without Holy Spirit power, we can't expect to live up to these standards. We'll just shake our head and walk away in frustration, but he draws us to him 
to hear these words so that he can impart them to us deep down in our spirit and give us power to live in the way that he has given us his example. He says in verse 40, in this same Sermon on the Mount, the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Don't let the perfect scare you away from the good. Don't let the perfect scare you away from trying to be better than you are. We will reach the level God wants us to reach to, uh, but we have to do it in close proximity to Jesus Christ. Look at verse 44. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush, bramble bush gather they grapes. And so faithfulness and fruitfulness go together. Every tree is known by its fruit. It's the fruit of having heard the message and taken it to heart and then applying it to the living of your life. In verse 46 of the same sermon, Jesus says to those who have heard this message, why do you call me Lord? Why do you call me Lord? But do not the things that I say. So before you give up thinking, you can live up to the standards of Christ and be a true disciple. Do your best to be your best. Do your best to be obedient and follow his example. For he has shown us how to love. He has shown us how to uh, offer compassion and love to God and to our fellow person and to ourselves. He's shown us how, which is why he can demand such a high standard from us. And in verse 47, he says, Whoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house, dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. This says to me that Jesus is trying to get his disciples prepared for the fact that our faith will be tried, that our witness uh, will have uh, the contention of storms to deal with, and that trouble and trials will come. But if we hold on to our foundation, if we hold on to our faith, we'll be able to survive the storm will be able to get through the crisis. I pray that as a disciple of Jesus Christ, you who have decided to hear the word of the Lord uh, will also decide to apply it to your living in such a way that with Jesus as your example, we can make it through any season of life, whether it be a sunny kind of season or a stormy kind of season. Tests and trials will come. Trouble will come. Scarce times will come. And uh, the scourge that we are involved in now is certainly one that tests our resolve to be followers of Jesus Christ. Because he has taught us to have compassion to everyone that we see. Not to see the people uh, that come our way as being as just carriers of a virus or a disease. We are not our virus. We are not our diseases. We are not our infirmities. We are all children of God who have been created by him for his glory. And I pray that nothing about this uh, virus will change us from the kind of heart that we ought to have one for the other. We still should be caring for one another as best as possible, helping and serving one another and trusting God to see us through uh, to victory. When this is all over, we'll be able to talk about what we learned uh, through this season that Christ wanted us to glean from having to be still a while and to know him more closely and to love him more dearly. When we come back together, saints, we're going to talk about uh, the battle for your mind as a disciple. Uh, the Greek word sophronismos, and Sophron, 
literally, literally means saving the mind. And we know that Jesus Christ, after he was baptized in the Jordan, was driven into the wilderness uh, to do battle with Satan. And it was a battle for his mind. It was a battle to keep his mind trained on the word of God, which he demonstrated was the best weapon for fighting uh, the influence of the adversary. The battle for our mind uh, is one uh, of self-control and discipline. And discipline is a closely related word to disciple because we're always called upon uh, to exhibit moderation. We're called upon to accept uh, a new priority for our living that is not of this world, but of the, of the kingdom of God. And that means that we uh, don't get up in the morning so concerned about our own welfare that we can't think about others or uh, not so tied to the riches and the material things of this world that we can't appreciate the invisible treasures of the kingdom of God, the fruit of the spirit, such as love and joy and peace and long suffering and steadfastness uh, in studying the word of God. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and soundness of mind. And that we ought to be steadfast, we ought to be unmovable, we ought to always be abounding in the work of the Lord. I love that word abounding. It means more and more. The closer we get to the Lord, the more and more we ought to uh, be a reflection of him. The more we open up and let him into our hearts, the more the gifts of the Spirit will be manifest in us. And so I'm praying, my brothers and sisters, that having to be sheltered at home doesn't mean that you will be less worshipful, not less prayerful, not less studious, but abound, saints. Worship him more. Worship him uh, in spirit and in truth, in your heart's desire to know him better. He won't be hiding from you. He's knocking on your door, asking, can he come in? And so don't pray less and less. Pray more and more. Don't give less and less. Give more and more as the love of God abounds in your hearts. If you are a true disciple, true disciple, you won't need anybody to count to three to tell you to shout hallelujah. You won't need somebody to tell you, turn to a certain hymn to sing the songs of Zion. You won't need somebody to say, let us pray. But every time the Spirit leads you, you will pray to the Lord and get to know him better during this time. So that when you come out from being in your homes, out from being sheltered, what a glorious testimony you will have as you have drawn closer to the Lord in prayer and in study and in the knowledge of his word. I trust that you will keep these seeds planted in a good place, water them with prayer, and we come again, uh, come together again, we'll talk more about the battle for your mind as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Lord God, we thank you for the visitation of your Holy Spirit, who is our master teacher. And we pray, Lord God, that the word that we have heard and received we will keep near and dear in our hearts and that we will apply it to our living such that the fruitfulness of it will be glorious to your name. Bless every heart, bless every house, and may those who have not known you before open up their hearts to receive you now as their own Lord and Savior. Forgive us for the shortcomings and the errors of our ways and let us rise up to the example that you have given us uh, to the word of faith, to the word of promise on which we anchor our souls. So let it be according to your word and will. In Jesus' name, hallelujah and amen. God bless you one and all. Till we meet again. Thank you.